Welcome, everybody, to the Rector's Forum at All Saints Church. My name is Mike Kinman. I am predictably the rector. My pronouns are he, him. It is wonderful to have you here. Uh, if you're new at All Saints uh, this morning, love to learn more about you. I uh, would like to keep you up to date on things that are happening here. There are green contact sheets near both doors. You can just sign up and give us your information, and we'll be in touch with you and get you all looped into everything that's happening uh, here at All Saints Church. There are restrooms just around the corner and to the right, around this corner and to the right. I want to welcome everyone who is streaming, everyone who can turn and wave at the camera, say hi to people who are streaming. No one turns anymore. Oh, it's like turn and wave at the camera. So uh, it's great having you all wherever you are. Uh, welcome to All Saints Church virtually. Great to have you here. Um, I want to remind you that uh, at all times we put our faith into action here at All Saints Church and every week we focus that action specifically with one thing that we do as an entire congregation. Uh, this week, I really, really hope you stop by the action table uh, to sign a letter to the member that you have of the California State Assembly to support AB 392. AB 392 is called the California Act to Save Lives. Uh, and it will update California's use of force standard to reflect the best practices of policing by authorizing deadly force only when necessary to prevent imminent death or serious bodily injury. Uh, all you have to do is look at the news to say this has not been the guideline for use of force so far. And you can imagine the groups that are lining up against this. So it is important. This actually makes our world safer, not just for civilians, but also for police. Uh, and so this is just a, this is really what I see as an absolute common sense uh, bill. And we need to support it about use of force because uh, it's literally, literally going to save lives. So please, please stop by the action table and sign a letter to your member of the State Assembly uh, to, to support this bill. Um, and then uh, finally, just thank you as always for the generosity of this community that continues to support uh, the incredible work that All Saints is able to do here and out in the world. And we got a lot of learning to do about how to do that work better, and that's part of why we're here today. Uh, and so if you've made an Easter gift, to All Saints Church, thank you so much. And there's still time to do it again if you haven't. Uh, and so um, you can make a gift for Easter. If you haven't pledged for 2019, you can do that. If you're online, it's super easy. Just like right down here below, there's a little donate button. Just click on that. Uh, and that will help us continue to do this work of radical inclusion and courageous justice, joyful spirituality, and ethical stewardship in the world. Uh, so thrilled today to welcome uh, Dr. Caroline Heldman. Dr. Uh, Caroline is an, a professor of politics at Occidental College in Los Angeles. Her research special specializes in media, the presidency, and systems of power, race, class, and gender. Uh, she is now the executive director of what's called the Representation Project. Um, and I am not going to tell you about that because she is going to tell you about that. And uh, Dr. Heldman, I just want to welcome you to All Saints Church and come on up. Thank you, Mike. It is wonderful to be here. Um, I am going to be talking about the fight for gender justice on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. So. I'm going to speak a little bit like an auctioneer because your brain can process things more quickly than I can speak, and I want to get through a lot. I want to talk about the current status of girls and women in the U.S. Uh, with just a few stats, uh, not too detailed, but to give us a sense of, well, where are we, right? So we do tend to tell ourselves that a lot of progress has been made, and it has, um, but we have a long way to go, and I want to map out exactly what we have left. Um, and then I want to look at the current gender justice fight and then talk about our work at the Representation Project and how we are engaging this fight and, of course, ask you to join us um, in this pursuit. So let's start with the current status of women in the U.S. Um, looking at the political landscape, the economic landscape, and the social landscape, but starting with the political landscape. Um, and I'm really happy to put that photo up uh, because there are a, an historic number of women in Congress, which um, we will talk about um, a little later. But I want to give us some context about how uh, long and hard the fight has been to get women into positions of political power. So at the federal level, um, it, 
Jeanette Rankin, right, 1917, the very, very first uh, woman in Congress replaces her husband. Um, we don't see much traction or movement until the 60s and 70s and that wave of the women's rights movement. Um, and we start to see, you'll see the year of the woman, 1990 and 1992. We have the Anita Hill hearings and a number of women um, across the United States get very politicized and angry at what happened during that hearing and the sexism that, that was exposed in the Senate and at the highest levels. And we start electing women in record numbers. Record numbers meaning like, ooh, 8%. Um, and so you can see that that uh, there are periods where you have these increases in women, uh, women in Congress, um, but then also very long kind of flat areas. So just to put this into context, women are 51% of the population. Um, we are celebrating the fact that we are up at nearly 25%. So uh, we are celebrating a 25 point gap. Um, and I think it's worth noting that that, uh, that is a massive gap. We have a long way to go. It's also worth noting that progress is not linear it doesn't happen on its own. It's fits and starts. If you look here, there are plateaus. Um, why? Because if we want justice, we want equality for, for different groups, we actually have to keep our foot on the gas pedal because the moment at which we take it off, we're sitting on a hill in San Francisco. It starts sliding backward. And so this idea that people have that, well, of course, society is just going to move forward because this is righteous and this is just and this is fair. So it will happen naturally. It's just not the way it works. In fact, um, it's much more cyclical. A, a better model is that you put your foot on the gas, you struggle, you make some progress, and then if you make real change, there's a backlash. So um, I know a lot of us are uh, very pained during this current era where there are, are overt rollbacks for, um, you know, name your group, whether it's transgender individuals or women or people of color. Um, but at this point in time, the backlash is actually indicative of the fact that real change has happened. Because backlashes like this only happen when the social system is truly coming apart, when it truly is shifting. Um, so congressional uh, looking at women in the US House looks very similar to the Senate. Um, the percentage of state legislators who are women, look at this really, basically a plateau from 1990 until about 2018. That gives you a really good sense of um, how progress, again, is not linear, right? That it actually does tend to stall out if we don't keep our foot on the gas pedal. Uh, the percentage of state governors who are women, I, I put this chart up because it actually shows areas where we do roll down the hill, right? Um, where because the uh, foot was not on the pedal um, from 2000, well, 2003 to 2005, we see a dip, um, and then we see a pretty significant dip um, from about 2008 until 2018. We actually see it dipping and plateauing. And then the percentage of cabinet or cabinet level positions held by women at the federal level, I put this slide up to show something else. So yes, it has the same patterns, right? Cyclical, plateauing, going backward. But it's fascinating to see that we didn't get women, so we had a, a smattering of women um, prior to this, but we didn't really get women as a normal part of the executive branch until Ford, right? Um, and, and this is a, just a blink of time. It's very few decades ago. So women just weren't in positions of power. Um, so while I'm talking about the stalling and the backsliding, it's also remarkable how far we have come in terms of just normalizing women in positions of political power in the last half a century. Um, all of this, of course, is intersectional. Um, I am uh, gl glossing over some of the detail here, but anything that affects white women is affecting women of color um, in a, a greater way. And when you look at overall representative democracy, collectively, white men have eight times as much political power as women of color when you simply look at the numbers at the federal level. Um, shifting now to the economic landscape, it looks rather similar. We've made progress, but we have a long way to go, which is the, the narrative of today. So you can see from 1981, um, this line, the uh, gender earnings ratio uh, based upon weekly averages um, is actually improving as well as the annual at the same time. The lines are uh, come apart a bit, but you can see that over time the trend has been very positive. Um, with that said, we still have remarkable gaps in pay for men and women. 
Um, when it comes to, if the standard is 100% uh, white men, um, Asian, uh, Asian American women are making 84 cents to a white man's dollar in the US. White women, 75 cents. Um, black women, 60 cents. And Latinx women are making 55 cents to a white man's dollar. And these gaps have been relatively consistent. We've made minor progress. We have gotten an entire two cent improvement in most of these categories in the last decade, two cents. Um, and it works differently for the weekly earnings for women with and without children and men with, with and without children. You may have seen this report recently that having children actually benefits men and having children is an economic detriment to women for a number of reasons. Um, but men with no children versus men with children are actually making 15% more, whereas the opposite is true for women. Um, and much of this, of course, has to do with how we think of and value, or in this, in many cases, devalue the work that women do, right? Um, so if you look at the, the college majors with the highest earnings on the left-hand side and the college majors with the lowest earnings on the right-hand side, you see some very distinct patterns, that there are very few women who are in the fields on the left, the exception being pharmaceutical majors, um, but all of the highest paying careers um, are dominated by men, whereas the lowest paying careers are dominated by women. So we have feminized our labor force, right? And we know that it's not, not something that's natural or neutral because we have this phenomenon known as the feminization of occupations, which means that when women move into occupations, the prestige and status of those occupations declines as well as the pay. I think the medical industry um, and doctors um, are the most recent example of this, but we also know that when men move into occupations and professions, they are treated differently in, into feminized professions. They are treated differently than the women in those professions. They have higher salaries, and they are treated better in those professions. So we have some fundamental problems with the way in which we value labor. And this, of course, does not take into account all of the unpaid labor that women are engaging in in the household. We know, um, for example, that if in heterosexual couples in the United States, that uh, men who are working outside the home and women who are working outside the home, that women will end up doing two thirds of the child care and, and house cleaning and homemaking work, right? So women are doing 65% of the lift. Uh, we also know that um, if a man has a spouse who is uh, working long hours outside of the home, he is more likely than other men to spend more time sleeping and watching television, whereas if a woman has a spouse who is working long hours outside of the home, she is more likely to put more time into homemaking. So there's some significant differences in the ways in which we value men and women's labor, which I think, of course, are indicative of the ways in which we value men and women. Um, moving now to the social landscape. Uh, this is this is where we it gets fun. Um, the social landscape, uh, really looking at media representations, right, and and how we value men and women based upon how we portray them in popular culture. Um, and really, I could just end the talk here. This sums it up. Um, <laughs> But in terms of, of how much women are showing up in our entertainment media, and, and again, these are blunt indicators of the value that men and women have in society, where our status is. And I think how much women show up versus men in entertainment media is important because it signals who, who is important in society. It signals whose stories are worth telling and whose stories are not worth telling. And you could say this for every marginalized group. Um, and the research we do at the Gina Davis Institute um, indicates that indeed, um, women of color, especially people of color, um, people with disabilities, LGBTQIA folks, are generally marginalized in, in film and television on the big and little screens. And when they are represented, it's often in stereotypical ways that are disparaging or damaging. But we certainly know that um, that there is a big gender gap in terms of representation where male characters uh, show up twice as often as female characters. Um, they receive twice, so we have this uh, algorithm um, that we developed with USC uh, called the GDIQ, and we know that men speak twice as often as women characters. Um, they also appear twice as often in terms of face time. Um, so it's really clear whose stories matter the most and, and who, uh, whose narratives um, deserve to be told 
as reflected in popular culture. Um, the same thing with leading ladies, so we know that um, male leads outnumber female leads two to one. Um, and this, by the way, is uh, after the, the first uh, federal complaint about racial discrimination and gender discrimination in Hollywood um, was filed in the 1960s, and a number have been filed since. Um, we have had organizations that have been fighting for this for a decade now with research. So it's not simply a matter of not knowing. It's also not a matter of money. We know that uh, female-led films actually um, have closed the gap with male-led films. In some years, they make more money. In some years, it's slightly less. But the gap is closed, both domestically and internationally. So we can no longer use the excuse that it's about profits, because at the end of the day, um, not having women leads is actually leaving money on the table. Um, looking at this intersectionally, we know that um, across leads and co-leads, only three women actors were from underrepres um, underrepresented racial groups, and only three, or I'm sorry, only eight were 45 years of age and older. So there is a time limit for women in Hollywood. We expire around the age of 40, um, whereas men tend to, to um, go on and make a lot of money in, in their 50s and 60s. You know, Harrison Ford, Keanu Reeves, John Wick came out, and I'm like, okay. Um, what are you, some, somewhere in his 50s and he is bankable, whereas very few women are bankable um, and get roles uh, over the age of 40. Also, when women are presented, they're often presented as sexy stereotypes. Um, with some nudity, they're, they're invariably um, shown as, or, or more likely to be shown as attractive um, than men, bless you. Um, so men basically get to have more variance in how they are represented, both physically and in the types of characters they get to play. Um, we have seen the emergence of better rounded, more interesting female lead, leads in recent years, um, but it's often come at the expense where they're still sexually objective and I'm not going to tell you which of these, uh, you know, which of these characters I am being critical of. I like to be supportive of women, um, but when they show up as something I call FFTs, you'll have to Google that. Um, uh, basically, they're highly sexualized. Um, they're highly sexualized leading action hero characters who essentially exist for the male gaze, right? For the male viewer. So even though she feels very empowered. Right, and is being presented as being very empowered, she very much exists for the male gaze and the male viewer, which, of course, is not a position of power. Um, we are in the fight of our lives, right? We just are. Um, and we are seeing historic turnout in terms of protests and women running for office um, and a lot of good things in the face of um, what I think is fair to say is a war on women, given what just happened in Georgia and, and many similar rulings across the United States. Um, so what does the current gender justice fight look like? Well, um, it's it's heartening to know um, that uh, on the uh, Women's March, the first Women's March, 4.2 million women and men um, and other uh, gender nonconforming folks got together in over 600 cities in the U.S. and marched. This is the most historic, highest turnout for a one-day march in U.S. history, and likely global history, um, because th these sorts of marches can only really take, these massive marches can only really be coordinated in the information age. So um, this shows that there's an outpouring of concern and activism around this. So the, the backlash against women's progress um, is being met with an equal or perhaps greater um, pushback. Um, we also saw the emergence of the Me Too movement. I will say that I just um, published a book last year called The, the New Campus Anti-Rape Movement, in which I spend a great deal of time going back over the 130-year history that um, women have been organizing against sexual violence. And it is very important to note that it is black women and Native American women who've been leading this charge. So when we talk about the Me Too movement of 2017, we have to talk about Ida B. Wells organizing in the 1870s against sexual violence. And we have to talk about the erasure of women of color that has taken place. Um, 
I want to start, though, with the most recent wave, given time limitations. There were college students uh, on, on college campuses in 2011 and 2012 who were fighting against sexual violence on their, on their campuses, and in 2013 uh, launched a national movement by filing federal complaints, of which I was one of the early architects of the movement, working with these very brave survivors. Um, and we were filing federal complaints and raising awareness, and it got all the way up to the White House, right? all the way up to, to um, President Barack Obama telling survivors, I've got your back. So it was a moment in time that has never happened before where sexual violence was on the national agenda. Those words were coming from a president's mouth, um, which then encouraged the, uh, raised awareness in the US and encouraged more people to believe the Cosby survivors when they came forward a few years later in 2015. I should say, Cosby survivors came forward a decade earlier and their lives were destroyed. So we started believing them in 2015. By the time the Cosby, tri Cosby went to trial, um, there were 62 public survivors, 62, which I will tell you, working with the Cosby survivors, um, I know is just the tip of the iceberg. They all know n numerous other women who have not come forward. Um, but we started to believe them because college students raised awareness of this issue. Um, the women of Fox News then came forward, felt comfortable, more comfortable coming forward because we were in an era where we were believing survivors. Um, and then I should say I was one of the women who came out against um, Bill O'Reilly um, with a claim of gender discrimination during that time. And there was no possible way any of us felt comfortable doing that a decade earlier when he was engaging in these actions. Um, and then in 2017, the Weinstein survivors um, really put it over the top, right? Um, and Alyssa Milano had, does hashtag Me Too, which is a movement that was started by a black woman, Tarana Burke, a decade earlier. Um, and suddenly, we are talking about sexual violence um, in a way that we have never talked about it in this country. Um, we have greater awareness. Uh, the myths are still persistent. There's even been a backlash against this. But um, the fact of the matter is, we tend to believe survivors more than we ever have in this country. And that is a result of gender the fight for gender justice that's taken place in the last few years. We also have an, a massive surge of interest in politics. Thank you, Donald Trump. We can all say thank you, Donald <laughs> Trump. So. Um, uh, women's interest in running for political office went from 920 nationally. This is a, a survey um, that was done by an organization that runs training for women who want to run for public office and surged to 400, uh, sorry, 42,000 after the 2016 election. How many of you piqued your interest to run for public office after the 2016 election? Anyone? Any brave souls? Everyone's kind of looking around like, yeah, we're not, we're not throwing our hat in the ring. Um, yeah, politics is uglier than it's ever been, right, in the age of social media. And I will say, um, as an aside, my research on women candidates, I did a lot of research on Sarah Palin and Elizabeth Dole um, and some um, on... Um, uh, Walter Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro in 1984, and I can tell you without a doubt that social media has made the political environment more hostile for women candidates, um, not less hostile. But the beauty of it is it's this double-edged sword, right, where it's a more hostile environment, but then you have the ability to speak back in a way that we've just simply never had prior to the advent of social media in the mid-2000s. So what has this netted us? It netted us an historic number of women running for office, and it netted us an historic number of, of women winning office. So 14 women elected in the Senate, many of them first time, right? So uh, the first two Native American women um, in Congress, uh, the youngest Congresswoman ever. Um, it's pretty amazing what's happened in the last couple of years uh, as a result uh, of the, the war on women. Um, and I am the executive director of the Representation Project, so we are in the trenches on this, right? I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, our model of change. So all of the stats that I just put up and, and the lack of progress or that the long way we still have to go to achieve gender equity um, has much to do um, with the P word, right? Patriarchy. The old of oppression. It's uh, seen as the template for other forms of oppression. And it, simply put, it, it means that we value 
men more than women, right? And we view men as natural leaders. And we see this throughout time and across cultures, although it varies, um, and you know, it, it, it morphs uh, in order to maintain as systems of power tend to do. So when we truly challenge systems of power, they find different ways to maintain status. Um, human beings like to maintain their status, whether it's earned or not. Um, and so our model of change is that um, we need to fundamentally address the fact that we, um, that we value men more than we value women. And so there are many ways to do this. You could pass policy that requires people to treat men and women equally, which sometimes are effective, uh, sometimes not. Um, well, all of these levers are sometimes effective and sometimes not. Um, you can shift the culture through media, which is the lever that we're pushing. You can do it through activism. I mean, there are really so many ways to do it. You can do it through research. You could do it through lobbying. You can do it inside systems of power, through formal electoral politics, running for office. Um, you can do it as an outside agitator. So the representation project, was founded by Jennifer Siebel Newsom. So if you think she looks familiar, this is the first partner of California, um, and this is the organization that she founded. And our whole goal is that we want to challenge gender norms and stereotypes with the idea that if we can uh, shift the ways in which men and women are represented and gender nonconforming individuals are represented in media, then we can shift the culture. Um, and we do this through a variety of ways. And I will say, as a political scientist, my initially, when I, you know, my, my life's mission is essentially this, right? I want gender justice through an intersectional lens. I want gender justice. And so I initially wanted to go into politics um, and then went to study political science so that I could better understand how that lever of power works. And along the way, I discovered that while that lever is very important, and I'm glad people are engaging in that, um, that I think a much more powerful lever is media when it comes to shifting hearts and minds. Because at the end of the day, you can't legislate people's thoughts and you can't legislate um, their hearts and what they care about. But what you can do is provide media that shifts values, right? And so I am essentially in my ideal job in that I think this is the most powerful lever for shifting hearts and minds about gender in our culture. So um, we do this through film and through media. And by the way, um, Jennifer Siebel Newsom is the first heterosexual uh, partner in the United States to go by uh, the, the term first partner. Um, so when, and when she did that as a, in order to open it up to same-sex couples so that it just becomes normal, right? And, and also to men who might be in that position, um, I think acts like that are, are courageous and shift the needle when it comes to moving a cult culture in ways that we want. Um, so we do this through a, a variety of different ways. The first is through films. How many of you have seen misrepresentation? Okay, a couple of you, good. How many of you have seen The Mask You Live In? A few more. Um, I'm not going to ask about The Great American Lie because it's not out yet, but it has premiered at the San Francisco Film Festival. It premiered on tax day, um, and it's currently doing the uh, festival circuit and hopefully will be out. Well, I, I don't know. I can't predict the future, but soon. Um, so our first film exposes the way that mainstream media um, contributes to the underrepresentation of women in positions of power, primarily by objectifying them, right? By presenting them as sex objects. Um, the second, the masculine live in um, is a very thoughtful look at how the, the man box or the constraints of masculinity harm boys and men. Um, and it, you know, masculinity is a killer for boys and men, right? This bifurcation of the head and the heart, um, this idea that you can't show your emotions except for anger and then it bubbles up in certain ways that are not pro-social. Um, I mean, it, it, it's literally killing men and that because hegemonic masculinity or, or the, the normal masculinity that we've accepted as normal in this culture that we value, that we prioritize, encourages men to engage in high-risk behaviors in order to perform their masculinity that kills them at higher rates at every age. It also discourages boys and men from seeking mental health treatment when they need it, so counseling and therapy, um, which means that men have much higher rates of suicide than women. It also um, ends up discouraging men, this, this masculinity, this man box, discourages men from seeking medical help 
when they need it. So men are more likely to die from preventable things and from things that simply require medical care because they're less likely to seek it. So when I say that masculinity is literally killing some men and boys, it's not hyperbole, right? Um, and this is something we need to address in our culture, and this is what we do in a very loving way in the film The Mask You Live In. Um, the Great American Lie actually takes it up to the cultural level. It extends this gender analysis to say, gee, as a society, what would happen if we didn't elevate masculine values like the military and the various things that we fund because we value masculine things? And what if we started valuing more feminized policies like education, like healthcare, right? What would our world look like? What if we adopted more of a care economy? Um, and so it really, it takes, it's basically um, Mask 2.0. It takes it up to a different level. So our organization um, has had quite a reach. Since 2011, when misrepresentation came out, um, it's been screened in all 50 states and over 70 countries. Um, our curricula has been used 2.4 million times. Um, and film views, I, I put film views uh, 28 million times because some people have seen our films many times. So that's the, the total um, estimated number of uh, film views. Um, and these films have been impactful. So I want to um, jump off of this PowerPoint for a moment and take you to a screener, uh, or the um, preview trailer, there's the right word, um, of misrepresentation. The media is the message and the messenger, and increasingly a powerful one. In a world of a million channels, people try to do more shocking and shocking things to break through the clutter. They resort to violent images, or sexually offensive images, or demeaning images. When is it going to be enough? There is no appreciation for women intellectuals. It's all about the body, not about the brain. You all saw the uh, photo from the weekend of Hillary looking so haggard and what, looking like 92 years old. Breast implants, did you have them or not? If you waterboarded Nancy Pelosi, she wouldn't admit to plastic surgery. The fact that media are so derogatory to the most powerful women in the country, then what does it say about media's ability to take any woman in America seriously? I have close friends that will go to the bathroom and put on like 10 pounds of makeup, you know, and you're at school to learn. As a culture, women are brought up to be fundamentally insecure. Media creates consciousness. And if what gets put out there that creates our consciousness is determined by men, we're not gonna make any progress. Little boys and little girls, when they're seven years old, an equal number want to be president of the United States when they grow up. But then you ask the same question when they're 15, and you see this massive gap emerging. We're shortchanging voices that are urgently needed in public forums from ever getting to the table. As the most powerful country in the world, if you're not standing for the right values and for the right principles, that's a loss for the world. You get a woman in the Oval Office, most powerful person in the world, what's the downside? You mean besides the PMS and the mode swings? Well, the media treats women like shit, and it's horrible, and it's like, I don't know how we survive it. I don't know how we rise above it. I tremble. You can't be what you can't see. It's extremely important for women to be writing their own stories and giving them to people to really emotionally become impacted by. The media can be an instrument of change. It can awaken people and change minds. It depends on who's piloting the plane. Stop crying. Stop with the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotion. Don't be a pussy. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. Always keep your mind. Nobody shut. likes a tattletale. Bros come before hoes. Don't let you woman run your you life. You bitch. What a fag. Get laid. Do something. Be a man. Be a man. Grow some balls. The three most destructive words that every man receives when he's a boy is when he's told to be a man. 
we've constructed an idea of masculinity in the United States that doesn't give young boys a way to feel secure in their masculinity. So we make them go prove it all the time. Within their peer group culture, each of them is posturing based on how the other boys are posturing. And what they end up missing is what they each really want, which is just that closeness. In good times, guys are like really close to each other. But when things get a little bit worse, you're on your own. From middle school, I had four really close friends. Once I kind of went into high school, I struggle finding people I can talk to because I feel like I'm not supposed to get help. Our kids get up every morning. They have to prepare their mask for how they're going to walk to school. A lot of our students don't know how to take the mask off. What is it you don't let people see? Almost 90% of you have pain and anger on the back of that paper. If you never cry, then you have all these feelings stuffed up inside of you, and then you can't get them out. They really buy into the, a culture that doesn't value what we've feminized. If we're in a culture that doesn't value caring, doesn't value relationships, doesn't value empathy, you are going to have boys and girls, men and women, go crazy. I had anger issues in high school. I felt like an outcast. I've been suspended at least once every year I was here. We would just look for trouble and just like try to fight. Boys are more likely to act out. They're more likely to become aggressive. Most people miss that as depression or see it as a conduct disorder or just a bad kid. I felt like just giving up on life. You know, I actually had suicide thought to my head at sixth grade. I felt alone for, for a long time. And I actually thought about killing myself. Whether it's homicidal violence or suicidal violence, People resort to such desperate behavior only when they are feeling shamed and humiliated or feel they would be if they didn't prove that they were real men. If you're told from day one, don't let nobody disrespect you, and this is the way you handle it as a man, respect is linked to violence. If I can man up, why step down from that, you feel me? It's like instinct. Like a man. Be a man. Be a man. For my kids, I was going to end this hyper masculine narrative here. So, those are our first two films. And as you can see, um, really just tackle the issue head on. And we have a lot of great impact data. We have a few impact reports if, if you're interested in learning more, uh, looking at the data. Um, but a number of testimonials, I mean, they, they pour in, even still. The film Misrepresentation came out in 2011, and we're still getting essentially love letters from girls saying, you know, this changed my life. And from boys, uh, the film came out in 2015, The Mask You Live In, um, saying, you know, this, this just changed my life. And I'll tell you, I have um, a two um, adopted uh, trans sons and by adopted, I mean I know them only through social media, but they reached out and said, oh, what you said in the mask you live in, I was going to take my life, and, and this saved me. I realized that I could actually become the man that I wanted to be. Um, and so it, it's fascinating to see how um, media content can have such a profound effect in the lives of young people. Um, and of course, my, my two um, adopted trans sons are, um, you know, their parents are not accepting of that. Uh, but the mask you live in gave them the power to say, yes, I can do this, um, and I can still be in this world, and I can live in this world, and I can find my people, and I can be accepted. So um, the impact of these films on the lives of young people has been profound. It gives them permission to not buy into these damaging gender norms and stereotypes um, that do end up damaging boys and girls, and, and we live in a society with very damaged men and women as a result of that. Um, we also have a very active uh, social media campaign. Um, our reach has been tremendous since, um, since 2011, since the organization started. Um, but overall, just in the past year and a half, we've had 1.2 uh, billion impressions on our different social media channels. So if you're not social media people, this is where the conversations are happening. Um, sometimes not in, the, in um, the ways that we would like, but it's quite uh, fascinating to watch hashtag campaigns that pick up. So 
for example, um, we are responsible, our organization, the Representation Project, is responsible for making Super Bowl ads less sexist, right? So we did the Not Buying It campaign uh, back in 2012 and 2013, and I don't know if you recall what ads used to look like, but it was embarrassing to watch them, and it was embarrassing to watch them with, with older family members or with children because they were so inappropriate, uh, sexually objectifying women in ways that were simply absurd. Um, so that has shifted as a result of the Not Buying It campaign. Also, women on the red carpet are being asked different, more than just about their dresses because of the Representer campaign. You may have heard of that. Um, and I, I should preface this before I put up this horrible image. Um, just so far this year, so we are a media watchdog organization. We find content that we don't approve of and we go after it with hashtags, right? So far this year, we've shut down three, um, three campaigns so far, three ad campaigns. The first is for Mariner's Watch. I think it's self-explanatory why we targeted them. They pulled this, the, this ad series within 24 hours um, and issued an apology and even cited the representation project as being the origin of the campaign, the reason that they pulled it. Um, yeah, we don't appreciate selling watches using uh, implied sexual violence, it's horrifying. Also, um, we, uh, it took us about five hours to get the Steam video game platform, which is a very popular video game platform for young kids. Some of you likely have children or grandchildren who are using Steam. Um, they put up a game called Rape Day. And so we did a hashtag campaign on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, and they pulled the ad, or they pulled the game off of their platform and issued an apology. Um, and more recently, I don't know how many of you saw this Ancestry.com ad that tried to romanticize a master-slave relationship, and the, the enslaved woman speaks no words in the ad, and they talk about, you know, how they're, he's talking about how they're going to run away um, and have a life up north where they can be free, enough with the romanticization of sexual violence uh, during that period in our, our nation's history. Um, Ancestry.com did pull the ad, and they apologized. Um, also, more recently, um, we've started a, a sexism 2020 campaign, uh, noting the fact that many of the men who are running in the race have appeared on uh, the, the covers of major magazines. Um, and we'd like to take credit for this. We ran this, we started this campaign a week ago. And next week, the very first woman running for the presidency is going to be on a magazine cover. So. These are the sorts of campaigns we're constantly running. Um, we also run youth programs where we have a, a youth media lab where marginalized youth um, are, are free to come into this space and make their own content and learn how to make their own films and podcasts and blogs. We also run uh, youth media academies where we're training the next generation of filmmakers. Um, we're running academies in Oakland and Los Angeles this year and scaling up next year. And then the Youth Media Summit where we bring uh, hundreds uh, of youth together to talk about how to make better content in media. Um, and then our Youth Media Summit has profound impacts. 100% say they, who attend say they plan to promote gender justice. 93% say it increased their knowledge. So um, this is the call for you to join us and sign up for our weekly actions. Follow us, bring our curriculum and films to your schools and your community, and support our youth outreach programs. And I will end it on that. Thank you so much. So a, a, a couple things. First of all, we're gonna we're gonna make sure we're gonna put this on all of our platforms. Uh, you can take a screen, like a picture of it, if you want. But we're gonna make sure we put this on all of our platforms. Um, second thing is we didn't have time for questions. Would you come back? Surely. Great, and so we can have more of a conversation. Um, and then uh, I also wanted to say um, I, I I discovered you know you not because I, I knew this, but Juliana Serrano. Uh, said, this is someone you absolutely have to uh, pay attention to. So first of all, thank you, Juliana, for bringing Dr. Helton to our attention. And then can we just give uh, our thanks to Dr. Carolyn Helton.